Hello everyone. Before I begin, two things to remind you of. In seven days, I'll be heading to the Men's March in London and speaking at the event following it. Details in the load bar and so on and so forth. Also, in 14 days, I'll be heading to Calgary to continue with the precedent we are setting against convention organisers shitting on their own contracts in the name of some mad dogma. The trial of the Honey Badgers versus Calex and the Mary Sue begins again on November the 28th, and we need your help to get the badges there. Entirely voluntary, folks. <laughs> you, you get the content for free, and you can drop a penny in if you feel like it. <laughs> I like that system. It pleases me. I'm, I'm not saying it'll bring about world peace or anything. I, d I don't think anything will, but I, I think cr voluntary crowdfunding is pretty cool if you can get it working. Would anyone like to know why I'm wearing this? When, when you see someone wearing this, do you ask them what they're attempting to express? It's an important question, given that you don't have to pay for these. You don't have to fund a specific organisation to have one of these. You can take one and drop a few pennies in the box if you want to, or you can take your pennies and give them to the charity of your choice, or keep it. So this essentially represents whatever I want it to represent. But I have to admit, this this is the first time I've, I've worn one of these since they were teaching us about it in primary school. And the reason I've never worn one, publicly or otherwise, is because I've never been able to articulate what it represents to me, beyond some people died in a war. Yeah, bravo. <laughs> some horses ran and some cows went moo. It's basic stuff. And if you can't articulate what a symbol means beyond a kindergarten reading level, then wearing it is not just pointless, it's pretentious. Worse, it's virtue signaling. Even when I was nine years old, I could, I could sense that virtue signaling was a thing and just didn't have a word for it. <laughs> but it was quite apparent to me that wearing the guise of giving a shit about something when you don't give enough of a shit to understand what it is is you know lame <laughs> a whole nother level of lame so if you wear a poppy and someone asks why are you wearing that and the best you can come up with is some people died in a war then yeah you might be better off not wearing it you really would we call it remembrance day that means you have to remember something, not just display something. But I'm wearing one now, as you can see, because I think I'm ready. I think I, I, think I can give an answer as to why I'm wearing it, an answer that, that won't get me interviewed by Triumph the Insult Comic Dog. But since I seem to operate better in the response format, I'm going to structure this video around some other people's explanations as to why they wear a white poppy. I wear a white poppy because it remembers all the victims of all wars, not just the Allied military dead, but all victims. I don't wear a red poppy to remember victims. Remembrance is the first step to worship, and for one thing, I've no intention of worshipping victimhood, though I'm not confined to a slippery slope there. Like I say, it's just one thing. It's not that I th think we shouldn't remember victims, it's that we already do remember them. It's quite automatically. We don't need help remembering victims. We've evolved as a social species to be very good at sympathising with each other's vulnerabilities. So good at it that it makes us psychologically fragile. And there's a reason you don't let a child see someone get murdered. And you even have to be careful letting them see a cartoon deer get murdered. Because witnessing the act of victimization, fictionally or otherwise, is traumatizing for a human being for the first like decade of their lives. In other words, it is not just easy to remember victims, it is difficult to forget them. So difficult that it can cause permanent damage if done wrong. Like, so, you know, people died in World War I. 
simple fact. I've known this fact ever since I learned about World War One and what a war is. It's easy to remember the fact that there was a war and people died. But what was slightly more challenging to remember, what I didn't really understand until I grew up and could make sense of what politics involves, was that World War One was an exceptionally stupid war. No, not all wars are stupid. If you are being invaded, it is not stupid to declare war on your invaders. World War Two was very much an invasion situation. But the first one was more like it's just a chain reaction of European authorities going territorially and ideologically insane, getting unreasonably paranoid about each other, and deciding to resolve their disputes by creating a giant meat grinder in the middle of Europe and throwing men into it. You, you could say you don't support the military because it fights illegal wars like Iraq, but I, I don't wear this to support military decisions. I wear it to, to protest them. And these are the kinds of decisions I'm protesting. An illegal war is nothing compared with what was done perfectly legally in World War One. It's when a government has to make up lies in order to send soldiers to die. That is egregious, don't get me wrong, but it's even worse when a, a government doesn't have to make up lies because they can simply force their male citizens to become soldiers and then go die. The only reason those authorities were able to have that war was because they had license to do whatever the hell they liked with their male citizens. In a time when a great many of them did not have the vote. If the average Tommy had any say in it, they'd have said, I have no idea what you toffs are bitching about. I have a family I'd like to get back to. World War I happened in a time when men were nothing but toy soldiers. Objects at the mercy of the state. They had no more human rights than the very munitions they were carrying. That information was difficult for me to remember. Because it was very difficult for me to get my head around in the first place. Like, you know, the, you know the pyramids, yeah? In Egypt. I don't need a poppy to remind me that there have been dead people under those things. <laughs> it was one of the first things I learned about what a pyramid is. They have dead pharaohs underneath them. I, I, I could comprehend the mystery of their construction. <laughs> you know, woo, maybe it's aliens, dun dun dun, and so on. It's not, that's not difficult for a child to remember that either. But what I didn't appreciate until I was older was that, you know, a significant part of the advanced technology they used to build those, those things was slavery. And not just slavery of other people, slavery of their own people. To, do, to build the pyramids, they had to keep, you know, sailing up and down the Nile and going to every village on its banks and telling their male inhabitants that they had to go work for the pharaoh now. So, you know, hop on the boat and get going. <laughs> and they just had to do it. They just had to drop all their shit and go, bye bye children, bye bye wife, I'm off to work for the pharaoh, otherwise they'll kill us all. I might never be back, bye! And then they went to the capital to move massive stones around in the Blistering heat all day without any insect repellent for the rest of their lives, for all they knew. Anyone who's ever worked as a labourer will have some understanding of what I'm on about there, but only some understanding. Don't forget. <laughs> do, you see, do you see I'm saying don't forget because this is a sense of perspective that's easy to forget. No matter how much labour you've done for honest pay, no matter how much military combat you've faced voluntarily, no matter how much you've, you've chosen to sacrifice, be thankful that you get to make that sacrifice. You get to make that choice. You get to choose the motive of your sacrifice. Many of the men who died in World War I didn't get to make that choice. They were robbed of their only life's opportunity to sacrifice themselves for their own chosen reasons. They were sacrificed involuntarily for someone else's reasons. Now that, now that sounds like the element I'm remembering is indeed victimhood, but it's not. It's sacrifice. S sacrifice necessarily involves agency, yours or someone else's, but victimhood does not involve agency. 
You might say the equation is victimhood plus agency equals sacrifice. Self-victimhood plus self-agency equals self-sacrifice. Or sacrifice to the, to the power of self, if you want to write it that way. I, 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 I don't work on remembering people who happened to be standing under a bomb when it landed. I feel bad for them. You know, the last few seconds of their lives were probably very stressful, but for those men in the trenches, the last few years of their lives were as stressful as, as that. Waking up every day to the sound of falling shells, any one of which could be the one that kills you. The difference is, most people run away from danger, but some people run towards it. And some men are forced to run towards it before they are remotely ready to. Like the slaves of ancient Egypt, like the soldiers in World War One. They were only given the choice of a quick murder at the hands of the state, or a slow murder at the hands of the state. And they took the slow murder. Now that's that's a head fuck, but what it what it certainly isn't is pitiful. It's admirable. It's not disheartening. It's inspiring. If you were given the choice, what would you do? Be killed on the spot, or become a slave? It's an extremely difficult question. If, if not in theory alone, then certainly at the point where theory meets practice. What would you do if the gun was to your head? Do you even know? If your only choice is to be a dead martyr or an enslaved martyr, what would you want to be remembered for? Dying? Or <laughs> running towards certain doom for the rest of your life? I don't know. I honestly don't know what I'd say. But I know what I'm grateful for. I'm more grateful for the men who spent years dying than the men who spent seconds dying. Indeed, the people who spent seconds dying. Because it's so easy to forget. It's, it's harder to remember years than it is to remember seconds. You can, you can watch the fleeting seconds of another person's death electronically and fictionally from miles away and years in the future but you can't watch the years leading up to it you can't you can't experience what time torture is without going through it yourself the most terrifying prospect of hell is not the pain or the anguish but the fact that it lasts forever and there are men who have lived it on earth as it is in heaven death, pain, torture, disease watching your friends get massacred in front of you you have no idea why you're there or if it's ever going to end it takes a lot of effort to develop that kind of empathy for that kind of thing not just individually but as part of a shared understanding that's why I wear this puppy because it reminds me of the things that are difficult to remember. Do you know what I mean? There was a little girl in my class, she wasn't a particular friend of mine, but one day we happened to be chatting during playtime. And then the next day, she wasn't there. Her house had had a direct hit by a bomb. She was dead. Well, clearly you were the primary victim of that. Because you were left behind all alone. What would you think of me if I said that sincerely? Her older sister was blinded. I'm sensing a theme. This is the human cost of war. He said, over some footage of some other form of human cost. This is the human cost of war. And the red poppy says nothing about them. The red poppy says whatever you are willing and able to say about it. The ones you can get for free, the ones you could make by yourself with an envelope and a red sharpie, and the actual poppies you could get from a florist or maybe even a field. Whatever you wear represents whatever you, as the wearer, are willing and able to articulate about it. 
But for the record, the botanical significance of the red poppy is that they were the only plant that could be seen to flourish in the trampled soil of no man's land. That's how they became a symbol of hope, a hardy little flower that survives despite the harshest of conditions. There's, there's a certain... There's a certain honour to that, a certain poetic honour. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm, my, my message regarding this poppy centralises on, this is to remind us, never to let this kind of war happen again. Never to create hell on earth and force men to go there. I am not, I'm not worshipping honour as an excuse for this slaughter. That sort of thing can become instrumental to the problem. A, a hijacked sense of honour very often forms the motivations for an invading army. Of suicide terrorists, yes. Men will die to save other people's lives. They will live in hell to save other people's lives. Men <laughs> will live in hell on earth, actual real life hell, to save other people from an imaginary hell in the afterlife. That's, that's pretty extraordinary. And as larger groups of men learn to cooperate with each other, this sense of honour only multiplies. And if men's honour falls into the wrong hands, it can be used as a weapon. Not just to fight wars, but to start them in the first place. And I will stand with you and protest if and when that happens. But the the poppy isn't just a protest. It w Again, just me, but it's part, part protest part celebration. What's worth celebrating is that men have that sense of honour, innately. The fact that it can be hijacked proves that it is there. I'm, a, you know, I'm against planes being hijacked and I'm against guns being misused, but that doesn't mean I'm against planes or guns. I'm frankly in awe of what technology is able to achieve and I think it's worth remembering. But far more importantly, in my opinion, Men have an instinctive, empathetic nature to be self-sacrificial. I'm very strongly against its misuse and its hijacking. But I'm not against men. And I'm not against their instincts. I, I, I don't want to take the sense of honour they have and try and flatten it out. <laughs> flatten it all the way out of their personalities. In the hope that that'll bring about peace. I don't think it will, for one thing, and in any case, I'm in awe of men's honour, and I appreciate it as the driving factor in civilization that it is. Men are willing to run towards certain doom for the sake of their collective. I think the very least we can do, we as the collective they fight for, the least we can do is let them choose their own place in the collective. And to choose their own path through the collective and beyond it if they please. And not because I think it'll lead to peace, but because they deserve it. So with respect, sir, you don't get to tell people what their red poppies mean, or what they are saying, or who they are saying it about. You have to ask them. But if I want to know what white poppies mean, I can indeed ask the organisation that sells them. That's right, sells them. I'll be wearing a white poppy this year, which is going to be my first time. As I've always worn the red poppy, and the red poppy just symbolises all the military deaths. But the white poppy symbolises military and civilian deaths, which is felt by everybody in war. Exactly. It's felt by everybody. It's already in the public conscience. I wear the red poppy because it goes that step further and at least attempts to remember what is not felt by everybody. Everybody understands that death is tragic, but not everybody understands the observation that men's good nature, when abused, can be turned into a catalyst for war, so we shouldn't abuse men's good nature. <laughs> Sorry, I guess I'm nature policing now. Women and children in particular are often the unseen victims of war and of conflict, when actually they are, they are victims just as much. And we finally get to the part of the video that made me angry enough to respond to it. The, the theme I was sensing earlier has been thickened like the plot. Somewhere along the line, you got it into your head that this is all about victimhood and nothing else. So naturally, you thought to yourself, 
hang on, if this is about victimhood, then surely women deserve an equal or greater measure of, of the currency involved. I mean, come on, it's women. You can't beat them at victimhood. Gimme. Okay, I'm not going to attempt to argue with you. You're wrong, but I'm not interested in this fight right now. I'm not here to remember victims or victimhood. Certainly not by itself. I'm not just here to remember the people who were standing under the bombs. I'm here to remember the people who ran towards them. Voluntarily or otherwise. And the vast majority of those people were, and still are, men. You can have all the victim bucks you like. Oh, go, go play with the victim bucks. Build a fort out of all the victim bucks you've accrued. But you don't get the sacrifice bucks. And, and the red poppy, to me at least, is about remembering sacrifice and self-sacrifice and no women are not sacrificed to war just as much as men are not even close by all means wear your white poppy if all you care about is victimhood that's fine as a matter of fact i'm glad we've managed to find a, a line in the sand that we can draw the red poppy let's say is for commemorating self-sacrifice the white poppy is for commemorating victimhood I'm happy with that. I will be wearing a red poppy. Because, you know, if glorification is the problem, if if you think, without asking me, that by wearing this red poppy I'm automatically glorifying something, then by wearing the white poppy you are glorifying victimhood. You are one step closer to worshipping victimhood. To repeat, I do not wish to worship victimhood, or even glorify it, or even celebrate it. To be honest, I celebrate agency. I celebrate the things people do, not the things that are done to them. I'd rather have a god with a hammer than a god who died on a cross. Good day to you. Every town centre, every train station, every TV presenter is poppy, poppy, poppy. Yes! And while wearing those poppies, this is the kind of shit they say to men. Power centres are still dominated by men. You don't need a separate day or a separate debate. Dominated by men. You don't need a separate day or a separate debate. Dominated by men. You don't need a separate day or a separate debate. Disbelief, disbelief, disbelief. The suggestion was met with disbelief. I can't be bothered. But again, you, you, you have to ask people what they're saying by wearing their poppy. In Andrew Neil's case, he's saying something, 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 but men don't need a separate day or a separate debate. So as you can see, you guys and the BBC are very much on the same page as each other. Let's all virtue signal together, but let's, let's make sure none of the sympathy lands on men or, or, or on the unique nature of men, because only, only victims deserve sympathy. And whoop, men aren't real victims. <laughs> All we've really demonstrated is that people who wear the red poppy are sometimes just as shallow as the people who wear the white poppies. I'm not swayed, I'm afraid. And these poppies are sponsored by the people that profit from war. That cannot be right. Again, you don't have to pay for the red poppy. You do have to pay for the white poppy. Unless you make it yourself. Why don't you just make it yourself? And the white poppies to represent all human beings that have suffered. All human beings. <laughs> all human beings! Oh, oh, they actually subtitled it in all caps and with an exclamation mark at the end. Yes, thank you. We, we get it. All human beings are victims. I'm not interested in arguing that motion, but here's an unpopular truth. Men sacrifice more. Men sacrifice themselves more. I'm not saying that that makes men superior in some way, and I'm not saying it makes it okay to sacrifice them. I'm just saying. It is what it is. That's, that's a tautology I don't use very often because it annoys me. But sometimes it makes sense. Men sacrifice more. It's not good. It's not bad. It just is what it is. It's a biological property of humans. We don't have to worship it. We don't have to destroy it. But it's helpful to at least acknowledge that it is. To put it in modern terms. A thing. Regardless of race, colour, creed, sex or age, we need to commemorate all the victims of war. Well, at least just sticking to the theme, but I still disagree. Arguably, all victims are important to remember, but the ones we need help remembering 
are the ones who, in the process of their victimhood, enacted all the personal agency they were capable of. Peace is something that we, by necessity, need to work for. We need to work for it harder than we work for war. Agreed. And for that, we need to look outside the box. You can't just confiscate the guns or the vehicles or the phenomenon of men's unique sense of honour. <clears throat> the existence of these things is not the root of the problem. I don't know what the root of the problem is. I don't think this is a root because of mycelium network. We're never more than two fungal life cycles away from war. There's, there's no answer that will achieve peace forever. It's something we have to be vigilant about in every generation. On a collective and individualistic level. Because humans aren't perfect. And we're not about to evolve into something perfect anytime soon. As long as we're humans, we'll always live with the risk of war. The moment we think we've found a way out of this is the moment we once again plunge headfirst into it. Wear your heart on your sleeve. <laughs> wear, your poppy, wear your poppy on your lapel. Um, just to show that that's how you feel. Okay, that was just fluff. But nevertheless, no. I will wear on my sleeve what I want to wear on my sleeve. It may be one part heart to three parts spleen. It could be some fancy cufflinks made out of my bollocks. It could be nothing at all. I could, I could keep my guard up and hide behind my cynical sarcasm. And that's fine too. You can glorify victimhood if you like, but I'm going to do something else. I think we can coexist with each other though. And I don't have to add an extra poppy in order to confirm that I'm willing to coexist with people. I can do that with the one poppy I choose to wear, for the reasons I choose to wear it. White poppies have been worn since 1933. Thank you for the factoid, it is irrelevant. White feathers have been worn since long before that, and white ribbons have been worn since long after that. These are arbitrary, what's your point? Well, arguably they are all affectations of the same ideology. It's the only point I can think of. Today white poppies are distributed by the Peace Pledge Union. Thank you for the shill. It is relevant for illustrative purposes, if nothing else. Quick reminder, not everyone who claims to stand for peace really does. In practice, stand for peace. It's very possible indeed that they just help cause war. Life is complicated. Try to remember. If I may offer an abridgment to your closing statement there, to align perhaps with my reasons for wearing the red poppy this remembrance time, to remember the sacrifices of war, to challenge totalitarianism, to build a culture Pause.